Janet Hurley from uh, Extension Program Specialist in the School of IPM, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension and Associate Certified Entomologist here today to talk to us about winterizing our homes about our I almost said pets. I'm sorry, pests. <laughs> <laughs> All this talk about dogs, I saw pets. So, uh, Janet. Well, thank you, Danny. Get started, I'll go ahead and mute myself. Okay, well, thank you, Danny. And you can call them pets if you feed them and nurture them in your home. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. So, good afternoon, everybody. And um, welcome to the webinar, let me make sure I can get my screen working right. So, I saw a little blurb in the chat pod about what do I mean by winterizing, and so let me just give you a little preview about this. No matter what kind of home you live in, I don't care if it's a McMansion like you see up here on the left-hand corner, you live in an apartment community, you live in a ranch-style home or a walk-up, multi-level home, no matter where you live or dwell, you're worried about what kind of pests you have. We all encounter them. There's an occasion where you might have an ant or a cockroach or a bird or a bat or a rat, something. Well, one of the things we don't always teach when we purchase a home is or move into some places, how do we keep the pests out? We all talk about the paint and stuff, but we really don't talk about the, oops, sorry the bugs. And this being football season, I, I threw out my, my best football moniker, the best offense is a defense. It's true with pest control. And the one that I have lived by all of my life is an ounce of prevention and support the pound of cure. Can't stress this enough. If you don't like flies, you don't like rats, you don't like ants, don't like roaches, then you can do a lot to prevent. Some of the ones that you may or may not be able to prevent, well, yeah, the bed bugs or the ticks, those are outdoors. They can be an occasional invader. They can come indoors. Bed bugs, I mean, not bed bugs, excuse me. Um, lady beetles, they're an occasional invader. Stink bugs, they're an occasional invader. In the South, we get crickets. Everybody has some type of occasional invader, but how, again, do you keep them out of your home? We have a big difference between the South and the North. I understand that, but just because I live in the South does not mean I need to have bugs. I've heard this more than once when I do school inspections, so, but it's true. I don't live with bugs unless I choose to, and my name is actually Wizzy Brown, and she's listening. And there's a few others that I also know. I saw that Jody, there's a couple of Jodies that I saw were listening, and a Matt. So I know some people do live with their bugs but they're choosing to live with them. So what is a healthy home? So let's start with the basics. Before we start with what is IPM, let's start with what is a healthy home. Well, believe it or not, there is a um, national movement through HUD and the CDC to, to talk to homeowners about what is a healthy home. It's supposed to be constructed and maintained and rehabilitated in a manner that prevents disease injuries that result from housing related hazards. I mean, homes that were built back in the mid 1800s to the early 1900s, well, they had lead paint and asbestos. Well, we now know that if you renovate a home and you've got asbestos or lead paint, you gotta be careful about that. But it's also, we might need to talk about what do you do when you take over the home and about pests. I often see homeowners neglect those areas where rats and mice can come in or how ants can come in. So this is what this talk's really gonna be about today. So before we get started, just to put everybody on the same page of what I'm gonna talk about when it comes to integrated pest management, it's the combination of approaches to achieve a maximum result. Okay, so what we really say is it's common sense and science-based rather than solely based on pesticide spraying. I have a hard time believing that any product once sprayed kills a bug dead. One thing will solve a rat problem. No, it is a multiple control tactic. There's lots of stages. 
So today, all we are going to talk about is prevention and monitoring. I'm not going to talk about identification of what kind of rat species. We have other webinars for that. I'm not going to talk about record keeping and different things. I'm going to talk about how do you keep them from coming into your home using IPM. So the three main areas that we emphasize when we're talking about integrated pest management. All right, so the process being pest prevention, those sanitation maintenance steps, fixing a door, um, sealing a window, caulking, making sure you don't have any gaps, anything like that, making sure that there's not extra food. I mean, one pest can prey on another pest. Believe it or not, mice and rats will eat cockroaches. So, I mean, sometimes you got to get rid of the roaches. IPM process, making sure that you manage the pest and the pesticides at acceptable levels. So what does that really mean? My threshold level of rodents at my house, and you're going to see some pictures of my house, is zero inside my house. Do I know that they live in the neighborhood and in my yard? Yes. As long as they live outdoors and they don't come across the threshold, it's fine. But trust me, I have to fight that all the time. This is the time of year where I start seeing activity and between now and probably December, I'm going to have to make sure that my home doesn't get invaded by rodents and that's being vigilant. and we'll talk about that. And then communication. No matter if you're living in a single dwelling or a multi-level dwelling or if you're the apartment manager, who you are, or even if you are an extension professional and you're going to be training others. When you do the training or when you're doing anything related to IPM, it's all about communication. Everybody has a role. This is, I always link IPM to playing tug of war. You cannot win in a tug of war war. Got that? Um, unless everybody is pulling on the rope at the same time. You can't just have one person pulling. So the IPM program, no matter where you're at, home, office, school, Wherever you want to implement IPM, everybody has a role in it. So the basics of IPM. Integrated pest management reduces exposure to pests. Yes, because when you're vigilant and you're watching and simple things that can be implemented can actually reduce pest populations. Reduce reduction of exposure to pesticides. Not everything needs a spray, okay? And then indoor allergens. If you don't have pests and you don't have pesticides, that helps reduce your indoor allergens. Now, again, if you're taking over someplace old or someplace that's not been cleaned, this can be lengthy because getting to that cleaning, li cleaner living environment really does take some effort, but it is a constant effort. You can never, ever let your guard down. So IPM also improves as I said, human environmental health. Doesn't matter if it's a clean classroom or if it's a clean bedroom. I realize that some of us have got teenagers. Um, that may not always be, or you live with a male that doesn't like to pick up after themselves. Sorry, men. But whoever that is, but why it is so important to keep the environment clean. Stress with family organization. Okay, I see enough shows to know that, you know, sometimes this is a stressful point with some people. Believe it or not, making it organized, and I didn't put any images in here, but I was going to speak about it here. Where you set down the kids' backpacks when they come home from school? Where do you put the coats? Where do you put things that have been exposed outdoors in? Make it a one-stop landing so that things aren't traipsed all over your home. I mean, it's little things like that that you've got to start thinking about. How do you improve your indoor air quality? Well, again, less clutter, less items laying around helps with the productivity and indoor air quality and the health and comfort for everybody in the home because, again, they're not stressed. All right, so why do people tolerate exposure to pests and pesticides? Because believe it or not, um, in the next year, you're going to be seeing probably a survey from us coming out through this, this link. And we're going to be talking about this particular topic. 
why is it people think that if that image of a can with a spray kills bugs dead? Most people believe it's because that's what they've been told. It's easy to do. I can go to any big box store and, and do that. It's, you know, I can't envision any other better way. I mean, I'm sure you all can chime in on the chat and say, well, that's how I was raised. Yeah, I was raised that way too, until I learned what IPM was and I'm like, never again. So let's talk about it because it has been a controversial topic and I just wanted to bring it up briefly. Concerns with pesticides. Pests can become tolerant of or avoid pesticides. This is true. You can go look up, it up on Snopes if you need to, but we do have research evidence on this. Risk from exposure may outweigh the benefit of killing pests, okay? I'm going to show you an image in a minute. And then there's also, especially when it comes to rodents and rodent baiting, EPA changed the rodenticide rules several years ago so that even you, the homeowner, are very limited about what you can do to put out rodenticide. But you've got to be very careful because you don't want a child or a pet or another top non-target bird or something like that actually eat that rodenticide. And then again, depending on what you're doing and what has been done, because when I was growing up as a kid, spraying a baseboard with an organophosphate was very common. Well, again, now we don't do that quite as often. We shouldn't because one, organophosphates are gone. Two, we have such better prod products that we should be doing targeting bait applications and things like that. But again, You've got to be careful about what goes on in the environment because of children, older, older citizens, or pregnant women. People with um, immunosuppressant diseases. We, I live in Dallas, so we have a Dallas cowboy that's been diagnosed with um, Guillaume Bure. Bure I, sorry, I'm going to butcher that one. Y'all know the one I mean. It's the G1 and the B word. And anyways, but it's an autoimmune disease. So people with autoimmune diseases can be very sensitive to triggers on both ends, both on insecticides and pesticides, herbicides of the like, and also pests. D their um, dander, their, their droppings, their frass, all of that can be problematic. So again, keep people with chemical sensitivities. And then, like I said, I, was, I alluded to this, the bad results of, um, using some insecticidal products. You have heard it in the news, you've seen it, but again, these are all um, actual cases of why they're called bug bombs. They're a bomb. So let's get into the good fun part. Seven principles of a healthy home. What do we need? We're keeping it dry. You know, and I'm not just talking about, oh, flood prevention. I'm talking about, you know, relative humidity in your home, in your basement, in your attic. That is extremely important because there are insect pests that can thrive on that. Clean. Okay, and I did not throw this in. I'm not asking you all to become me and live on a hoarding scale of one where everything has got to be immaculate. I understand, and I do have dogs. But I also understand you have to live in your home. But what I don't want you to live in is I don't want you to live in where they call it category 10 in hoarding, where you cannot move. That is unhealthy. That is the principles through HUD and CDC. Safe, safe means a lot of things to a lot of people. In my world right now, my safe is no tripping hazards, no gnawing hazards, no biting hazards. Well ventilated, well ventilated is extremely important because that goes back to your health and well-being, and if pests will thrive or not thrive in your environment. Pest-free, we'll explain that more, contaminant-free and well-maintained. The reason I'm talking about well-maintaining, you're looking at a home, and yes, it's got some beautiful trim work on it, but it also has a lot of places on that roof line that squirrels, rats, bats, all could get in. That's just three. I won't talk about just birds because that's just another one. Those are several species that aren't what we're always normally talking about. But that, if you don't maintain those eaves, those soffits, 
then you're going to have a problem. So how do pests get into your home? Well, in this image, hopefully you can see all the arrows, but tree branches touching the house. Trees, depending on where you live, and this is, again, Sam, I know that you're in Canada, and I know you will not know what a crepe myrtle is. But in the South, we have these things called crepe myrtles. They're beautiful flowering trees, but they're ne when next to a home, they're beautiful flowering trees that invite aphids in scale, which invites ants. And then when the trees go dormant in the wintertime, the ants move in. So again, a tree touching your home. It, where are you? Is it a squirrel getting in? Is it rodents? Is it ants? I mean, it's a variety of different things, but trees touching a home, yes, they give shade, but you don't want them touching the roof because then they lend to being a bridge for something to come in. Plant boxes and open windows. I mean, we all love beautiful greenery. We all like that. But what happens when one, there's a hole and it gets into your wall of the house, or two, you've put all these plants out during the summertime and you're in the south, and then you bring them in. All right, well, then you've brought them in and you probably brought in something. Ants and roaches are the two most common. What else did you bring into the house? Have you gone abroad? Did you go to the grocery store? Did you go to a thrift shop? Where did you go and get something? Because sometimes those items, I mean, I know the New Yorkers who are listening to this can testify to the fact that when bed bugs really got on a roll up there, you know, they would slash mattresses so people would not pick up the mattress and bring it back in. Where are you going and what have you brought? Be aware of your surroundings at all times. And then again, planting near the foundation. When I'm talking to schools about their foundations and even my own home, and I'm going to show you pictures here in a few minutes, I keep promising. But again, moving things so it's not up against your, the house. Give yourself that 18 inch room so that you can look down your foundation. Is there something burrowing? Is there something mounding? What is next to that foundation at your house? So here are a few examples and these are all real, real life examples, AKA they came from Janet's camera. Um, prevention, exclusion, exclusion, exclusion. You've got to either seal it up or repair openings. And a lot of people see stuff and think, oh, I really don't need to do that. You would be surprised what one little opening can do to, or to what will invite pests from coming in. Do you have birds roosting? Look at that bottom one, that, that's ants. That's ants coming in under a baseboard on an exterior wall. Well, what was on the other side of the wall? Well, there was a mound, there was extra soil. Do you have a door, okay? So let's talk about roofs. We're gonna start from the top and work our way down. Chimneys, if you've got a chimney, one of the most important investments you can do, and I am I'm behind on this one, I am not practicing what I'm preaching, but it's on my list of things to do, is getting a chimney cap. Notice the one on the left versus the one on the right. The one on the right doesn't have a chimney cap. The reason I say that this is important, you notice what's sitting in that upper right hand corner, that is called a chimney swift. Because I don't have a chimney cap, I have chimney swifts that move in. They, they migrate, they come in, they have their babies, they leave. The problem is, is that chimney swift could leave mites. They're an ectoparasite, they live with the bird, they eat off of the bird and stuff. Well, the mites could come down into my chimney and then get into my home. Fortunately, but the way my, mine is and what I do to keep that from happening, um, I've learned that you burn that first fire really, really hot. But this year I will get a chimney swift to come out, chimney sweep to come out to clean the swift's nest and put a chimney cap on. But as a homeowner, if that's something that you don't have, think about investing in that. All right, look at your eaves, look at your soffits. Watch for bird nests. I mean, the only ones that we legally can um, eliminate are starlings, sparrows, and pigeons. 
However, if it is something like um, one of these sparrows or the, uh, the other type of swifts that build their mud type nests, as long as you remove the nest before they have their babies, in other words, you got to pretty much get it as they're building it, keep taking it down, take a, 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 a hose or a power washer and wash the mud, they won't build. Again, the reason you want to be concerned about that is notice how close these, both of these nests are to vents. Those vents go to where there's actually attic air return space. So again, you want to be careful because you don't want any bird mites moving in. All right, again, talking about those soffits, I really wanted to pull this out and show you three different types. You've got the little small holes, you've got the circle that's generally on a, on a pitch of a roof, again, for airflow up in an attic, or you have these vent soffits. Something most people don't, home inspectors don't talk to, to people about when they're doing these home inspection is how important it's to A, one, keep these vents clear of any clutter and to make sure that they're a, adhered to the structure. In other words, you don't want one ripped down. I could have put one in and I thought, boy, that really messed with y'all, but you want to make sure that no bats, no birds, no rats, bees can move in because once they move in and they're in your attic, why would they want to leave? And I'm very serious about that. Looking at the soffits and taking one more further step. Again, these are paper wasps and that is what this image is, is the paper wasp and Wizzy or Vicky, if one of y'all would put the regular scientific name on this one as well um, for, for the chat people. But these are straight paper wasps. They make their cones. You can see two images here. But notice one is on a, a window frame and one is up again by that soffit. Again, not hard to remove and you really do. I mean, they're beneficial, but I can understand if it's on your back porch or cl close to where, you know, your kids play, you might not want this. Easy removal, again, using a hose, using a power washer, but make sure you take the whole nest down if you can reach it. And if you wanna be really good, if you don't kill the brood by smashing it with your foot, um, you could take it out and toss it in a field and the brood may come out. Wizzy might have a better solution. So, now we're getting into the nitty gritty because this is Janet's current home. I took over my mother's house about five years ago. And part of the reason I did this was while it could use some, what they refer to as lipstick and makeup, um, it really didn't. It needed more than just paint. It needed some really hard work. I had to go in and really mow down the vegetation. But one of the problems I have where you see this circle is I was having problems with rats. When I moved in, there were rodents living in the attic and in that extendable shed. And yes, the little critter in the corner is an exact reputation, rep representation of the rodent I was dealing with. It's called a, a roof rat, excuse me. So you see a circle and you see two arrows. All right, the circle and the two arrows shows that this is where the rodents were getting in. And what's interesting, and the reason I'm showing you this image and not the previous image, what it looked like before, was because I had done repairs and then we had hail move in. And when the hail moved in, I had to get a new roof. This is my brand new roof and my roofers left me this hole. And in this hole was enough space for me for the rats to actually get in. I had sealed up where the two arrows are at and zooming in so you can see, and I will show you what this fabric is later, but this is a special um, elasto polymeric fabric that I actually wove in to where they were going to seal. My roofer, just so you know, and I, I'm doing this for educational purposes, my roofer suggested to me that they would come back out with some expanding foam and foam that area. And, and ladies and gentlemen, I will just be very honest with you, the roofer didn't last the rest of the phone call because my comment to him was, no, I will handle this myself because expanding foam is not the solution for roof rats. 
in North Texas. And I'm, I'm very serious on this because the rats can chew through this and that would happen before in this same exact area. And I have sealed and I've resealed this area because now that I've got this, this material, I've had no problems knock on wood. But where you see that other lift below, that bottom left arrow where you see the cable wires going through, those are all cable wires. But I had to leave them because they also run a line from the attic to a, a bedroom. So I again wrapped everything again with that special material so that again, no, no squirrels or rats or even flying insects, nothing can really get in there because of the way I've done that. But I had to get on a ladder and do a little work, but it wasn't that hard. The only thing I will tell you is when, especially when I show you this material, you must wear your gloves. This image is the other side of where that hole is. And the only reason I show you this is this being the attic side. What was telling to me was when I went up in the attic and it didn't even come out in this picture, I could see daylight. I could see where you could run a hand. And if I can run my hand into something, if you can run your hand into something, then if that is no tr trouble for a rat or a squirrel or even a mouse. So again, this was something I really, I was protecting my investment. I was protecting my investment of my attic because I actually had a very nice friend of mine from New Orleans come over and look at my rodent problem. And where you see that piece of um, poster board over on the left, that's where he tried to fall through my attic trying to, to rescue a um, rodent carcass. For those of you that know Timmy Madiri, you can just all laugh at him. Now, this is looking deep into your attic. The reason I have got this image up here is for a couple of reasons. Your attic is some place you need to remember to go look at. Some folks store stuff up in their attics. In Texas, most of us don't store a whole lot of stuff because it gets real hot up there. But again, I show this for a couple of things. One, go up there. Make sure you're not seeing daylight in places that you shouldn't be seeing daylight. Do you have any flashing? Is anything poked up? Do you see any black or rub marks? Um, things like that. The next thing I'm going to talk about, and I'm do, doing it on this slide, has to do with insulation. If you learn nothing else from me today, if you're a brand new homeowner and you don't have at least that much insulation as you see puffing up, you need to. This is the number one investment in your home, energy efficiency, but you can also see rodent trails and that much puffy insulation. Two other things that I want to show you that's related to the attic, because in the image to your left, you can see the rodent droppings. That is from when I had active rodents up there, but you could see the droppings. You could see where they were actually trying to trail. It didn't take long because it was only one rat that got up there and I got rid of him very fast. The other thing to watch, not a problem in my house, but it depends on how your house is built. If you've got an AC, AC heating handling unit, part of it's up in your attic, part of it's down in your home, in your garage, watch these areas because there are little places. Remember, rodents only need the size of a dime or larger. I refer to that as my index finger or two fingers. Any opening like that, and yes, there's got to be openings for the vents, but the vents, once they're around, then they should be enclosed, shrouded. So I want you guys to remember these are these are problem places. One other thing, the water that can build up in your AD, AC condensate be, can, can become a water source for mice, rats, roaches, and ants. All right, let's move outdoors. So you're working out in your yard and you're walking around your house, or do you walk around your house? And when you do, do you look at your house from the foundation up to the roof and everything else in between? Because if you're not, you're not protecting your home. Things that you might want to think about to winterize your home. What about your windows? Is there a way for those cute little lady beetles for them to move in and get on the inside of your window. 
So in other words, if you see them in this bottom right-hand corner, there's a window and there's a screen. All right, they build up there. That's not a big deal. It's when they come in on that top image and they're on the inside lip of the window because that happened to mom and she about flipped. They were able to get in because there wasn't a good enough window seal. How well are your windows sealed? Can you take a candle and will it blow? Can you take smoke? They actually have these little smokers that you can use and they actually can show you where the wind's blowing. If you think about it from a cost standpoint, every time you see the wind blow from your windows, that's heat or air going in or out. Take your pick. The next big one, your doors. Front door, back door, what kind of door do you have? And I'm gonna talk about apartment doors as well. But what kind of door do you have? If you've got a door like this, all right, you've got a screen door, do you have a glass door? What kind of door do you have? And then you look at this threshold and you think, oh, it's a threshold, yeah, I see a little bit of dirt. I don't need to worry about that. Let's zoom in a little bit closer. Do you see that little hole, that little gap right there? That is enough room for a mouse to get in. That's more than enough room for crickets and cockroaches and ants and scorpions, depending on where you live, and any other creepy crawlers, again, depending on where you live in, in the country. But little things like that, paying attention to a door sweep is a big deal. We talk about it all the time when we talk about school IPM, but we don't really talk about it when we're talking about maintaining our homes. And this again is a big winterizing thing or summarizing if you'd like, because if you live where it's more AC than, than heat. Again, this is what a door sweep, a good door sweep looks like from the outside of the door. You can see that it hits the threshold, nothing can get through. I'm going to show you an image of a couple of door sweeps, but I mean, you can go to a big box store and you can spend as little as five bucks in as much as 80, depending on where you live and what you are facing. Which means next, you live in an apartment complex. And trust me, apartment complex these days vary so much. I joke about schools varying so much, but apartments really, you can have everything from every person who lives in the complex has an exterior door and it goes to a breezeway, or it can all be enclosed and it's a high rise and there's limited ways, but pests can thrive in environments. But even these doors, even these doors, can have a door sweep. You can do something to help. And you can put the door sweep on the exterior of your door so you don't have to worry about things crawling through it. Again, there are some that have come pre-impregnated with repellents. You might want to do that outdoors rather than indoors. I mean, it's, it's up to you, but what I'm trying to stress here is everyone can have a door sweep. And hiring a handyman or getting someone to do this Boy Scouts should be learning how to do this. And Girl Scouts, sorry, I do not want to be gender specific. So again, if you live in a single family, family dwelling and you have a garage, or even if you live in a townhouse and you have a garage, and some apartments have garages, so a garage. Garage is all right. This is my old house. This is the one that I moved out of before moving into mom's. But this garage door, again, every garage door is like a headache for me. Here you go, you're thinking, oh, it's a garage door, right? But then there's this hole, because you don't see it from the front side, but you can see it on the back side. Well, again, they make garage door seals, sealing this up. The other point, and I didn't put an arrow because it was going to get kind of confusing, but if you go up from the orange arrow and back towards that white wall, that is also a gap and an opening. Literally during the cold months, I leave two snap traps placed side by side on that those garage door openings in the event something tries to come through. Yes, I also have fixed since that opening, but I did want to show folks this is the types of openings you need to be concerned about because this is how pests get into your garage. Now you store your bird seed, your cat food, your dog food, whatever else. You may actually have an outdoor pantry, whatever. You store that out in the garage 
and the wildlife sees that opening, they get a whiff of it, well, they're in. Once they're in, why leave? You might not know they're there because you're not really paying attention. And then after a week, you smell something funny, that could be it. You've got rats living in your garage. The back side of your house. All right, we all have got, you know, we all like outdoor living areas. This is one of our, um, IP, our IPM water house, our water sense house, and here at our uh, A&M Center. And I just wanted to point out that there's plenty of places on your back porch to be mindful. What kind of cooking area do you have? This one's a standalone barbecue pit, but, but I do know some folks that have got some really nice outdoor cooking areas. What do you do on cleaning? How, what do you store out there? Do you make it easy for rats, ants, and roaches to move in? What do you store up against next to the house? What about that? Do you have a pergola or something? Are there areas that, you know, carpenter bees can get in? What are there areas around that you've got to look at? So that when you're out there and you're thinking, oh, what am I just doing? Look around, notice your surroundings. Are there areas? We joke in my world and we say, think like a bug. But if you really thought like a cockroach or a mouse or a rat, you'd secure your house a lot more than just a, bur a two-legged burglar. Other potential areas. So hopefully, and I don't know if this will work, you might have to wait till the um, recorded, but you should be able to go um, to this YouTube video. And what you will see at this YouTube video is a night capture of this AC unit and what the rodents do at night. It, we cleaned this up since then, but I really wanted you guys to see that you don't know what goes on at your house at night when the lights go off. And we've done game cameras here around our IPM water sense houses. And I've also done them at my house. And you'd be amazed at what the wildlife brings. Which leads me to your next one. What kind of rainwater harvesting system do you have? Make sure that it's sealed. Make sure it doesn't become a mosquito trap. Make sure it doesn't become a harborage or a drinking or a water source for something else. Make sure if you're going to have these environmental features around your home, do maintain them. They don't go in once and you just walk away. You've got to maintain stuff. The other thing I want you to point out to here, and that's why if you can go to the YouTube video, you'll see. Where you see those hoses going in from the AC unit up into the wall, if you don't have that completely secure, I will tell you all that that's going to become a problem because that's a number one place rats and mice love to get in. So let's go inside and talk a little bit about this area. I refer to this as the danger zone in most homes because where do we store most of our cleaning equipment? We store it underneath our kitchen sink. And this becomes the problem area in a lot of homes. It gets water buildup, it gets moist. There's a lot of problems that go on under the kitchen sink in most homes. Two areas that are critical, the electrical box, because again, it's gonna have a source of warmth. So ants and cockroaches are gonna like that area because it's gonna be warm, all right? The other one, and this is why, I sorry if anybody just got grossed out and they were eating lunch while they were watching this, um, is underneath the sink and what cockroaches and water damage can do. So there are two species of cockroaches on this image. The one on the left is an American cockroach or a water bug, or people call it a whole other thing. They're the large cockroaches that most people don't like. The ones on the left are we refer to as German cockroaches. Those only live indoors. You will not get those coming from the outside in. There is an Asian cockroach in Florida and somewhere in the south that will do that, but they really don't want to come in. But if you see these little guys and they're underneath your kitchen sink, they came there because they came from someplace else. Either you brought them in, or if you're living in an apartment area, maybe they came from your neighbor, whomever. But this is one of the areas that you need to make sure that you seal, caulk, keep clean. Keep clean and dry. Keep clean and dry. Seal it, caulk it, make it clean and dry. Did you guys get that one? So what types of exclusion tools? 
I had to go find a decent Creative Commons picture. So this picture of a man standing in the wall, he's been bad because he's been given a vacuum. I put this image in here to remind you guys that vacuums are important, okay? If you can, please use a HEPA vac. If you can, use one that will at least, because I mean, it's the easiest thing. You've got ants coming into your home. You need to clean up something, vacuum it up. Use, you know, gloves. Use a face mask if it's really dirty. Protect yourself, okay? This is my reminder that you are important as well. But since my talk is more about exclusion, let's roll into the exclusion stuff. So sealants. The YouTube video is a friend of mine, Dr. Claudia Regal from the city of New Orleans. Um, mosquito termite rodent control board. I have to always pause to say the whole name. But she did a nice little um, YouTube video on what's the difference between a caulk and a sealant. What's, what's really important, why you need to be very cautious about this. But I'm putting this in here because I want you to understand it has to do with not just its elasticity, but it's also where are you going? Where are you putting it? Are you outdoors and are you going from brick to wood? Are you going from wood to metal? Or is, is it all concrete? Are you indoors? Are you in a wet area? Are you at a sink? Again, is it just wood to wood? Is it wood to brick? Is it wood to sheetrock? Cellulose, what do you do? Because the most important thing I want you to get away from this particular slide and the next slide is, is not all sealants are created the same. Basically, there are four types. You've got latex, rubber, polyurethane, silicone. Latex, good for indoors, minor repairs. I wouldn't put latex down as my number one pest proofing type of caulk. No way, no how. It, but it, ha, it serves its purposes. I got to patch a wall because I put a painting up and I didn't like it and I need to patch the wall. I mean, it, it all depends on what you're doing. Again, rubber. Rubber has gotten better over the years, and I'm sorry for that horrible grammar, but it really starts working well and can be used outdoors. Because it does have a solvent, you want to be careful. That's why I made sure that you understand that rubber is good, great for outdoors. You might not want to indoors because of the solvent smell. But again, it will work and it will adhere. So maybe you need to tack down some flashing or something. Then you might want a rubber sealant. The two that are probably the most used that you find most often are the polyurethane and the silicone. Okay, again, polyurethane, indoors, outdoors, non-corrosive, does a lot of things, very durable. Very, very dur durable, but again, you've got to make sure you get the right one for the right job. Silicone, generally silicone works really, really well around wet areas. So tubs, showers, toilets, sinks, you know, locker rooms, mud rooms, where, uh, maintenance closets, those types of things. You might need that to seal up. So again, that again, we don't have to worry about ants or roaches coming in. You want to make sure that again, any areas that they can breach, you want to make sure they can't breach. Just if they can't get in it, that ounce of prevention, then half of your battle is over. Alternative to sealants. So I told you I'd tell you about um, this product on the left. For years and years and years, the product on the right, this copper copper mesh, we used it. But you could, as you can see on the right, the rack could get a hold of that little bit of mesh on the bottom and they could work at it and pull it out. And then the company, and I'll let you go look them up in a little bit, that, that invented this excluder product on the left, realized that if you make this mesh and you tuck, tuck it into places, they can't pull it out. Matter of fact, it makes them bleed and they don't like it. And it's not just rats, it is also squirrels. It, I mean, bats ne don't necessarily pull anything out. You don't have to worry about that. But I mean, it all depends. You're looking at something 
totally typical. Somebody cut a hole for these two PVC conduit lines and they left me some nice little jaggered holes and they just leave it. The contractor would just leave it. Well, if I can stick my two fingers through any of those holes, which I know I can, then I know that a rat can come in. Well, once the rat's in my wall, why would you want to leave? Because they'll find food. So this is just an alternative product. And the YouTube video that I've got here is actually Timmy Badiri with the city of New Orleans. But he's also showing how you can actually patch a hole using a um, metal. They got very creative at this one school. We knew it was going to be renovated at one point, but it was so bad that the rat, I mean, rats were jumping out at students and teachers that for this project we were working on, we went in and sealed up the building with whatever we could. And I'm serious. Sometimes that's all you've got to do. If you've got to do a patch job to at least, at least exclude so nothing else moves in when you're doing your control, you got to do it because the old adage, oh, they're going to come in and they're going to go out looking for water. No, they can get their water from their, their food. They can get water. You'd be surprised where they can find water. So door sweeps versus weather stripping. This is me and I'm not promoting anything exceptional. I'm, promote, I'm wanting you to see that there are new products on the market. For years, we had the brush door sweeps they were out there i remember when i started that we thought they were the greatest things in sliced bread then this company excluder came along and they came up with these rodent and pest defense door sweeps thanks to dr bobby corrigan they make door sweeps for everything garages you name it doors they make them for the double doors they have a whole variety of products but what's nice is it uses their their fabric around a very heavy rubber gasket. If you're dealing with, and I know there's a couple of pest control guys here that's listening as well, if you were dealing with a customer and they were having problems with rats chewing through the doors at their facility, they're coming trying to come in the back door, I'd spend the extra bucks and put one of these in because again, the best offense is a door, defense. Defense one, seal them out. The one on the left is a repellent door sweep. This is a brand new company that's been around for maybe about a year or so, and they're, they're going through some growing pains. But it's your normal door sweep. The only thing is it's that plastic bag is actually got a, a, a repellent seal. Kind of works really, really well in the South on an exterior door to help repel against like ants and other little crawling critters. You can generally get like a six month window depending, again, depending on where you're at. If you're in tawny, crazy ant country, this might be the only thing that keeps you from going completely insane because those little ants can move in and some days you want to just cry. Y'all in the North don't know what I'm talking about, but the people in the South have ever been through tawny, crazy ants will tell you it's enough to cry. Weather stripping, that's the center thing. There are so many different levels of weather stripping. Again, Make sure you get a good seal on your windows. Make sure you get a good seal on the door. Don't let it pop. Make sure it doesn't rip. Yes, they don't have a lifetime warranty. These are something that as a homeowner, you're going to probably replace every five years. Some, some you might not have to, but depending on if, if you've got, especially if you've got kids between the ages of six and 18, then the door is open all the time, but, or pets. It just depends. But again, these are important things to keep your home pest free. So in wrapping up, we all have homes. We all like to live in our homes. We all don't want to live in homes with pests. The best offense is a defense. Monitoring your home for pests. Walk your perimeter property watch look in those eaves look at the soffits look around the foundation is there anything going on that would would lend itself right now is probably the perfect time because between september and thanksgiving the weather's going to change things are going to happen around you but these are the times as the leaves fall and things change you can see the out exterior of your structure watch for those pest vulnerable areas and, and try to 
keep them under control, seal them up. If you don't know what to do, seek an expert. I know they'll put my contact information. We're always happy to help, especially if, you, if we work for extension, we're always here to help. Finally, here's some resources because this is a mixed audience. So I've got a little bit of resources for just about everybody. This first link goes to um, a community webpage called Pass In and Around Homes. This is under the e-extension um, umbrella and we will maintain this content. I don't know where it will go in the future, but in this website is a lot of information for, for everybody on a variety of pests. Anything from ants and a variety of ants to flies, to cockroaches, to rats, what can you do? How do you deal with it? For those of you that may be um, county agents or other health educators who would like to do training or maybe you um, live in a homeowners association and you want to do some more training, these next four um, links are for you to use. The Stop Pests and Housing, that's actually um, a Northeast IPM Center website, plus um, in, co co in conjunction with HUD. And as you can see, HUD also has their healthy home stuff. These two kind of go together, but it's all about not just pest management, but also what really means by healthy homes, which goes to the other two, the National Center for Healthy Housing and the Healthy Homes Partnership. This is also other training, so it goes into more than just the pests, like I was talking about the, the clean, the seven steps to a healthy home. It also talks about radon, it talks about asthma, it talks about um, lead paint. There's a lot, and, and especially if you are an extension agent listening today and you're looking for, for different resources, these are all great places that you can, can get additional resources. And again, if there's anything I can help you with, I'll be more than happy to, happy to do that. So there, Miss Danny. Well, thank you. That was that was awesome. Um, we have time for a few questions. If anybody, if anybody has one, and while um, I'm going to look, if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat box or the Q and A. I'm going to go ahead and throw up a few um, survey questions that I know y'all have been dying to answer. So anybody have any questions? Sounds like you did too good of a job covering everything. To Justin, I, Justin Headlund had put in a chat box about, um, heavy wrap pressure on their on the excluder products yes but you answered your own question you said heavy wrap pressure i mean they're good in a in a moderate but if you've got a really bad i mean if you've got a really bad rat infestation that's a whole different webinar as well just so you guys know that requires a whole different level of this this is most this was more about prevention, preventing things from coming into your home. Okay, I've had a couple of people ask either about take, about notes and or would this be posted? Yes, this, if you check back on the, the website that you, that you got here today, on Monday we will post the recording. So you can, you can watch it as many times as you would like. And as Danny just said, I am hoping that when you do that, because I know in the past, when you go back to watch the recorded webinar, you can generally get in on those links. Well, anybody, we've got, a, we've got another minute if you have a question. Janet, I hope you're looking at the, the chat box because you have gotten many compliments about the great presentation. And yeah, I'm trying to find a question. <laughs> Will the slides be available? Yes, we're going to make that available. Thank you, everybody. I mean, I tried. It's, it's hard when I can't see y'all. 
It will be posted on the on the 2018 All Bugs webpage. Renee was asking that. The links to all of them are on that page. And you can actually that link that it was in here for that. Um, let me see if I can back it up. This top link right here, that articles extension. Uh, I don't know if this will do this. I could get scary. Um, that top link actually, you can go there, and um, yeah, you're not going to see my screen. You can see where it says webinars, and once you go in there, it's on the right hand column. You can pull down the webinars. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? We have one. It says, I have ants near my hummingbird feeders. Any way to keep the ants away? I have tried everything under everything I know, and I have never been successful. Hence, I, pr I plant Turks caps so I don't have to put up hummingbird feeders. <laughs> and my mother has no problem. Um, Vaseline, I've heard, is, has worked. I don't know if anybody else. And to Andrea, yes. Um, I hope this helps. And if you need more information um, for your home visit stuff, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be happy to, to get you some more stuff. But those links that are on this slide that I've got showing, there's actually some extra stuff in there that will help you. All right. Go ahead. Somebody typed in ant mode. I've, I've never heard that. And somebody said no Vaseline because it gets on their feathers. Yeah, we've always done it on the, the string that runs from the deal so that birds are never near that. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope you, everybody has a great weekend. Everybody, we'll see y'all next month. I believe the topic is stru structure. Wow, I'm getting all tongue-tied today. Structural misidentified pests. So we'll see you back in, this is September. We'll see you in October for that. Y'all have a great weekend. Thank you, Janet, very much.